I'm here to present you with the early stage VCs versus angel panel. Every early, age, every early stage startup reaches the point where they need to navigate whether to accept money from angels or VCs. Here to discuss the following is moderator Greg Williams, executive editor at Wired. Joining him is Jem Zergoff, partner at Early Bird, Damien Doberstein, partner at eVentures Russia, Fabrice Grinda of OLX, Jose Marin, founding partner at IG Expansion, and Anad Maravats, managing partner at DN Capital. Please welcome them to the stage. Hello? Ah, it works. Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Greg Williams. I'm the executive, executive editor of Wired. Uh, I hope you're having an inspiring day. I certainly am. Um, I'm very thrilled to be moderating uh, this panel of experts. We're, we're thinking of it as Smackdown 2012, uh, VCs versus angels. There's going to be blood on the floor, so uh, get ready for it. Um, between them, these guys have got many millions of, uh, of dollars invested in various startups, various businesses. So we've got great expertise here on the panel. Um, and basically today's your best chance of getting information out of them that they wouldn't charge a consultancy fee for. So uh, without further ado, maybe you guys want to uh, start uh, introducing yourself to everyone, let them know who you are. Jen? Um, sure, my name is Jem Sartoldo. I'm a partner with Early Bird Venture Capital, uh, focusing on Eastern Europe and Turkey. I've been an investor for about six years. Uh, I come from an angel background, uh, going into professional VC for the first time uh, over the last couple of years. Uh, hello, I'm Damien Doberstein. I'm partner at eVentures, uh, eVentures Russia and CIS. Um, I'm actually, since uh, 2008, here in the region. Um, I co-founded Kupiweep uh, in Russia, and I joined the eVentures team uh, five months ago. And I'm Fabrice Grinda, the CEO of OLX, a big Craigslist for Brazil and India, and an angel investor in 103 startups with my partner, Jose. Hi, I'm Jose Marin. I'm an entrepreneur uh, and also an investor. I'm currently the founder and CEO of a company called IG Expansion, and also a very prolific angel investor with Fabrice. Uh, Nanad Maravats from DN Capital. Uh, I founded DN Capital about 12 years ago. We have three funds under management, investing in software, digital media, e-commerce, and mobile, companies like Shazam. Also, Reese's company, OLX, which we uh, made a lot of money in, uh, so very happy to be here. Great, thank you guys. So, first question, um, and for a lot of people in the, the audience, they might be wondering, uh, it might seem like an obvious question to you guys, uh, and Jim, you and I were talking about this earlier. Can you just drill down on what is the difference between an angel and a VC? Um, to me, the delineation is really whether you're investing your own money or uh, somebody else's money. Uh, to me, a venture capitalist is a professional investor, uh, an asset manager uh, who is entrusted with other people's money to bring returns to them, uh, thus much maybe more uh, structured and uh, much less flexible uh, right. than an angel. Cool. Yeah, uh, actually, I think it's mostly private money. Uh, which is invested by business angels, whereas uh, a classical VC is uh, investing institutional money. And so uh, with this, um, the incentive systems are also different, which entrepreneurs need to know. I mean, frankly, the things we do are fundamentally different. Ignoring for a fact that we're investing our own money and they're investing you know, other people's money, because we're investing our own money and we have less money than a whole bunch of institutionals, we're writing 50 to 100K checks. We're investing as part of a half a million, a million dollar round. These VCs are writing three, four, five, ten million dollar checks because they're, they have a hundred plus million dollar funds to manage and they're investing later stage. So there's a fundamental stage difference in which we invest. Yes, and what I would say is that there's a lot of times that we convive in the same environment. So a lot of times we do deals together, we love each other, and then there's a whole bunch of other times where we basically, you know, differ because of the stage. And I think that as you look to the market before uh, and how it develops, there's been different stages where opportunities have been better at the early stage investing or where there had been better at the Series A investing. And my personal view is that, uh, you know, as, as of today, you know, the, the seed investment space starting to be less interesting. You know, a lot of companies are getting funded at the seed level and there's gonna be a very interesting opportunity emerging, especially in emerging markets 
for companies that are great, that are not being able to raise capital, and then you'll be able to come in with less risk at Series A. So, and normally those checks are bigger. So I think it's just space where people convive. We have a love and hate relationship. Not more to add there, but I think the lines are becoming much more blurred. I think uh, if you want to get in the best deals, you have to go early. And so you have to work with these guys. So we've done like six or seven deals together, just the, the three of us. And, and uh, we work together with lots of angel investors uh, throughout Europe, also in the US. Uh, but absolutely, I, you know, we'll talk about it later, but I have views on angels, good ones and bad ones. And we can talk about that in a bit. Well, there's been a lot of talk recently about um, super angels and micro VCs. Do you think, is this just a fad or has there been a kind of a fundamental shift, do you think, in the kind of like the, the early stage investment landscape? Um, Nanad, do you want to maybe start off on that? Well, okay. So you have the professional guys, the guys that are doing lots of these things that actually know how a business works, like Fabrice and Jose and, and, and some of the Ron Conway, uh, Iden Circuit, etc. But then you have people who might have been singers or movie stars also coming into the business, which are paying stupid valuations. Okay? So very high valuations just because they want to get in, because they want to be seen as being cool investing in companies. And I think these guys are really bad for the market because they, they often will do a valuation of two or three times what the, the guys that actually know what they're doing will pay. And then the company gets stuck because they need to raise money again, mm. but they've raised money in their first round at such a high valuation that they don't want to uh, uh, go back to their investors and say, I, can't, I have to dilute you on the second round. And this becomes very difficult because then that company never gets real, good, pro, real smart money. Right. And I've seen this time and time again with very arrogant entrepreneurs that go for very high prices. I, I mean, one thing I'd like to add on this, the, so the super angels typically are quasi-professional angels. I mean, they're the people that have done it many times and will keep doing it. The issue is, in the last two years, there have been a lot of IPOs, Facebook, Zynga, LinkedIn, and all. The, it's minted two to 3,000 millionaires in the US alone, and the only thing these people think they should do with their money is angel invest. And so the amount of money coming in the seed stage and the angel stage has been exploding. Sites like AngelList are making it easier for them to invest. And so the as a result, the valuations have been, have been going up and it's very, very frothy. And the Jobs Act, which is gonna bring even more inexperienced money into that seed market is gonna make it even more difficult in the sense that it's gonna remain frothy for a while. And the other thing I would say is it, it started to get harder and harder. When Fabrice and I started investing in Central Europe, I mean, we were some of the first people that came and invested as foreign angels into Russia. And at that time, you know, a lot of uh, early stage entrepreneurs were incredibly thrilled by the idea of getting us and some of the people in our network, uh, you know, coming into the deal and making a differentiated strategy. And the prices that were being paid at that time were certainly an arbitrage opportunity. I think that what we are seeing more and more as of today is that the prices of a deal in Russia, with a deal in Brazil, with a deal in India, uh, they tend to converge to the same type of structure. So, you know, that's something that creates a lot of noise in our head because certainly, you know, it's not the same type of risk, it's not the same type of potential return on a market like the U.S. than the ones that we could potentially get in Brazil or other places, no? Maybe to add on here, so um, what I monitor here from Russia is that this whole super angel discussion is, yeah, really, uh, I think it's an American discussion mostly because you, even in Europe, where you also have this kind of second wave now, a lot of people um, have made money with Groupon and other companies, so there's also money coming into the environment. You have uh, new business angels, but in Europe there are basically no real super angels. And here in Russia it's even more behind, so you, of course you have some random money, I, I call it, but, but professionalized um, super angel money is really not available. And it's rather a problem that you don't have smart angel money, so it's everything behind. Um, one more point, uh, you know, as, as Fabrice pointed out, a lot of the uh, current angels or very active angels are uh, entrepreneurs, tech entrepreneurs themselves. And uh, I think end up really, you know, 
coming in as smart money. When, when I was raising money for my uh, US venture 13, 14 years ago, an angel investor was usually a doctor or a dentist with just some additional money in, in their bank account who would come in and just to hang out with young guys. Whereas now, uh, you know, the angel does roll up the sleeves and I think uh, has, has really changed the, the notion of uh, you know, smart money and being an entrepreneur's advocate uh, sitting next to them. So. Uh, I personally don't think it's a fad. I think it's uh, here to say just it's gotten a lot more fluid for uh, uh, young companies to get to get funded, access to capital. Great. So you guys must be bombarded with potential deals constantly. Your inbox must be constantly full of people uh, wanting to, in, sorry, wanting you to invest in their business. Um, can you just give us a sense? Um, what are you looking for? What, what gets your attention? What makes you excited? Uh, Jose, do you want to start maybe with this? Sure. I mean, we have a very structured approach into what we do. And I mean, not necessarily everybody has to agree with the way we do it, but we think very squared about and systematically of the type of deals that we like. In our particular case, we only like to invest in business models that are proven if they are outside of the US. If it's a non-proven model, it has to be US-centric, which means we don't like to take market risk and business model risk. If we're going to take our chances, we much rather do it in the US. And the second thing is you, we also have a very global approach. I mean, we like emerging markets. We like to take risk in places where maybe normally not everybody used to go. And I would say most importantly is about relationships. I mean, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we've been working with, you know, have eventually done their first, second business. They introduce us to other people. Uh, the people we co-invest with, I mean, we've done deals together with Jem, uh, everybody here, you know, so at the end, these people that you trust, that show you things, that you know that what you're getting, sure. you know, you can rely on. Sure. So I just want to describe our pipeline. So every week we get, a, we de, we get about 50 deals uh, from a variety of sources. Of those, many we don't even look at because the site is not live, the union economics, and we want the sites to be live. The union economics are not clear. It's maybe in a market that's too small for us. Maybe we think the price is too high. We don't even look at it. We'll talk to, and, and, and we, we look at our statistics every week. So I actually know this for a fact. Last week, we looked at 14. This week, we're looking at 16. And I think the week before, we looked at 13. So on average, we talk to 15 uh, a week. And how many of those we do really varies. A year ago, we did almost one a week. And this, this year, we're doing one every other week. Damien. Yeah, so um, actually, if, if you ask what, what makes us um, exciting about companies, so um, you first of all have to understand our global structure. So we are a global partnership with five um, dedicated regional funds. So we have our base in San Francisco, uh, then the European office in Hamburg. We are in Sao Paulo um, as well with these guys, and China, Japan, and uh, Moscow for Russia and CIS. So um, of course, we are um, playing some uh, global topics and uh, global games uh, where we uh, landscape um, basically all, uh, all existing markets and try to um, yeah, have a uh, proactive deal flow where we define investment topics. At the same time, of course, um, we are getting the local deal flows in, in all countries and um, try to, to meet as much as, as possible uh, for founders, entrepreneurs. Um, and so, uh, f speaking for Russia and CRS uh, currently, so I, I think uh, Drew Gaff uh, did a very amazing presentation in the morning. So, for the global trends, uh, I completely share this uh, mobile, then big data, and especially for Ukraine. Okay. Um, then, for consumer internet, we still see a lot of niches open, but the big markets are getting slowly crowded. Okay. Jim? Um, for us, you know, I would consider uh, or cal classify us as a, a team and entrepreneurs investors uh, primarily. Uh, we are extremely focused on, you know, who is uh, behind the business, right. behind the venture. Um, we have basically collected uh, our own um, criteria in terms of, you know, how we identify and try to try to filter these teams. Uh, but uh, then we try to support and follow the entrepreneurs rather than try to try to guide them mm -hmm. uh, we see our job as you know being uh, there to allow for or let that entrepreneur reach their ultimate potential um, second factor is uh, is market size um, you know for us every investment needs to if, if, if all goes well needs to be a hundred million dollar plus exit uh, so if we don't see that uh, sometimes very attractive uh, niche opportunities yeah. come by but we have to pass on them our fund model doesn't allow for uh, smaller attempts. Sure. Bernard. 
So, uh, you know, I can't add anything to that. I think you saw Fabrice's slides before about his criteria. Sure. So add that criteria, but then, you know, we're not writing our own checks. We're actually managing a fund. So we're looking at investments where we can actually put out between 5 and 10% of our fund in a company over the life of the, of, the, of the investment. And also, we're going on the boards of these companies and actually playing a very active role. So a lot of times, the angel investors are, are not going on the boards. They're, they're talking to management, helping out where they can. But, you know, for instance, uh, you know, in a company, one of my investments in Germany, you know, we have put in the third managing partner. We've actually introduced them to lots of customers. And we get very, very involved in these companies. And that's hard to do if you have 100 portfolio companies. Yeah. So you would see at the end, each partner having between five and seven companies where he's talking to the management team every day. Mm -hmm. Every day, either an email or a phone call, and, and then actually adding something substantially to the boards of these companies. So it's, it's all the criteria is the same, but we have to write bigger checks and, and manage that carefully. And I'll react to that very quickly. I mean, what Nenad is saying is actually playing in our favor because uh, the, the way funds are developing today is they are raising more and more money. So they have the compromise of having to do less deals, which means bigger checks. So that actually open up new opportunities for people that have, you know, maybe not the capacity when we invest our own money, it's a very different thing. But, but certainly open up opportunities that before were VC taken that today could potentially be uh, taken initially by super angels, no? And then for us, it, it is absolutely critical to have good relationships with people that can help us fund our businesses moving forward. Because one of the biggest challenges in emerging markets is exactly that, is to be able to raise follow-on capital, no? And, 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 and the way we work is we try to build relationships with people that we know they will trust us, they know that what we build, you know, makes sense and, and they can rely on us so that eventually they can look seriously into what we do. Great, great. Great answers, guys. Thank you. So, um, Fabrice, maybe you could start us off on the, on the next uh, question, which is, um, when should a business, uh, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs in this audience will be thinking, um, early stage, do I go to an angel or do I go to a, venture, uh, to a VC for seed money? What's, what's, what, what different kind of examples can you give us of the right decision to make in different circumstances? I mean, frankly, if you're at early stage, you're wasting your time talking to a VC because They'll take the meeting because they, they're interested about the industry, they're interested in learning about what you're up to, and they want you in their pipeline for the day you're big enough that they can write a three to $5 million check. And they'll meet you potentially, and they'll take time, et cetera, but you, they're not going to write a check. And so in the early stages, you want someone who can decide rapidly and get you that first half million, a million that'll get you through the hump. Now, there are a few exceptions. Some businesses are just too capital intensive, and they're not gonna be angel backed from the beginning. But for the most part, you want to talk to the angels, but don't talk to the angels too early. Today, it's extraordinarily cheap to build a business. I can, I can build with 25K or 50K any website out there, and, and so should any entrepreneur be able to. And so when the entrepreneurs come in our door, we want them to have been able to build something with their own money or with their friends and family money. So build the site, get a little bit of traction, come and see us, and we'll give you half a million or a million. If you talk to the VCs, they'll talk to you, but you're wasting your time. I think Nanat's got something to say here. <laughs> Champing at the bit. So we're a little bit different. Uh, we, we love it super early. So um, we invest in PowerPoints. Uh, we actually create companies. We created a company called AppSmart with an old engineer from Shazam. We just sure. sold it recently for 20 times our money. Um, so our view is to get in absolutely as early as possible. We'll do PowerPoint. In fact, when we invested in your company, it was, I don't even know if you had a site. I think you had a site. Uh, but, you know, you wouldn't let us in earlier, but we would have gone in earlier. We, in fact, we talked to you about actually going in when you had the two companies and we were going to put money in. But we love it as early as possible. I think if you're not in early, you won't see it. So, for instance, a company of ours, uh, Vindlin in Germany, which is a diapers.com copycat, uh, we did the seed round. We put 250K in. The company hadn't launched yet. It did its first quarter's business plan in the first two weeks. It did its first year's business plan in the first quarter. Last year at a budget of three million, it did 6.7. Every investor in Europe wanted to get into that deal. If we hadn't put the seed financing in, we never would have seen it. So we love to just put tons of checks of 250K in the market. So we act like a seed fund, but we like to co-invest with these guys because actually these guys can help the companies a lot. Great, thanks. There, there's a fundamental difference as well, uh, which is how you are perceived by the entrepreneur. No, and this is something that dramatically changes from the fund to a 
group of angels. No? I mean, as angels, it's our own money. We are operating entrepreneurs that have built their own businesses that exited from them. So I think that automatically when an entrepreneur hears the, the word VC, their twist into valuation and terms you know, generally gets a little bit biased, let's say. No? So, so I think that, that, that as an entrepreneur and angel, sometimes you're able to get your hands around better, better deal terms. That don't, doesn't necessarily mean stage. Sure. I mean, there's people that are willing to take that risk like Nenad, but the truth is that there's not many. Right, sure. Daniel. Yeah, that's also, I think, an industry thing. So um, if, if you are able, as an entrepreneur, if you're able to find the right business angels, they really add a lot of value to your business. Um, and if, if they had run a, uh, previously a business like Segi Belusa from Runa here, for example, if I would do a big data company, of course, I would go to him. Okay, he's now VC, but, ne but nevertheless, he was an angel before, uh, for example. Um, but it's really about finding the right people because a wrong business angel can also destroy a lot. So this is maybe not a topic which is uh, often discussed, but um, actually, uh, so we see this in Russia, you don't have um, educated uh, business angels. So, so they're coming random guys putting $50,000 in, want to have uh, 51 person, and then the team is coming to you, sometimes even good teams, and pitch to you, and you say, guys, sorry, it's structurally so wrong, I like you, but how can I invest here? And it's a big problem if you take, take the wrong guys as well. Mm -hmm. Jim. Um, I, th I think Damien's point is, is right on. I, I think you know, um, the, the danger with, with, with some angels is that uh, it can, it can uh, hurt a company structurally. Yeah. Uh, and uh, another uh, issue that I see is uh, you know, uh, also depending on from angel to angel, uh, sometimes you know, angels can be so prolific that um, it's, it's a fairly thin spread of, of investments, uh, meaning that the time in involvement uh, gets lower and lower. And if uh, there's a lot of people involved in the in the transaction, then um, you know nobody's really uh, committed. Nobody's got uh, the real skin in the game. It uh, starts to be a bit of a uh, spray and pray uh, type operation, which I think can sometimes put the entrepreneur in a in a difficult position where they don't really have a confidant on on their board uh, that that they're kind of day to day uh, interacting with and have significant uh, commitment to the company and uh, is paying a lot of attention, similar to what Nenai was saying, you know, talking to the entrepreneur on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe so, often, can, can I, maybe, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe one point which comes into my mind. So, um, at the end of the day, it comes down to the people uh, with, with whom you work, actually. And as an entrepreneur, actually, I would not care so much whether it's uh, Peter or Fabrice or whoever. So, um, I, I want to like, uh, I want to work with the people I like. And if it's a business angel, okay, fine. If it's a super angel, fine. If it's uh, early stage VC, fine. So, this is, I think, most important for an entrepreneur because it's really like a marriage for years. I think it's really important for a lot of people in this audience to figure out when they're coming to look for investors, um, not just what you're looking for, but also how they approach you and how they go about their presentation. Like, what, what are the, I mean, I'm sure you guys have seen some great presentations and, and some great pitches, and you've seen some disasters as well. And I think it'll be really, really good information for people in this room. Uh, maybe, Damien, you could start. If you could just tell us, you know, when people are pitching you, what are the do's and what are the don'ts? <laughs> Sorry, Fabrice. I guess I'm often the first filter because we get these 50 emails in. Um, do not send me a business plan of 70 pages and it's vertical text. In fact, don't send me any vertical text. I hate executive summaries. I hate dense text. What I want to see is in your email, you know, what you're trying to do, how much you're trying to raise, how much traction you already have, and I expect you to be live. If the site is not live, don't even email me. And I want a 20-page PowerPoint. And that PowerPoint, the first page is what you do. The second page is how big this market is. The third page is what you've been able, how you're going to go and conquer this market. And then maybe you talk a little bit about your team, your unit economics, what you're going to do with the money you're raising, and where you intend to be with that money. That is it. Like 10, 15, 20 pages PowerPoint, and get straight to the point. No horizontal, no executive summaries, no business plans. And, I mean, it's even better if you're introduced by someone I know, but the reality is a lot of the companies we invested in, it was cold LinkedIn or Facebook message or email, so that's okay too. For me, for me you know, obviously all what Fabrice said applies. A couple of, of additional things. I always like to see that people are well informed of their business model globally. I like them to see 
that they are in inquisitive about what's happening in other places, what you know, people are doing, you know, are they later stage, early stage, how much money they have raised, from who. I think that is a very important thing. And, and another thing that, that is very relevant for me is the, the energy of the entrepreneur. I mean, I like to see someone that is ready to go out there and eat the world, you know, that can execute and that I see that is ethical, but at the same time, aggressive, no? And, and I think that shows in the character, responsiveness, you know, sharpness, someone that can really go straight to the point when you ask. Sure. I can't add much more to that. Uh, I would say Fabrice, 20 slides max. Uh, I would also say try and figure out a way to get to us without a banker. Like, don't come with a banker. Sorry, Marco, I don't know where you are, but uh, if you're a good entrepreneur, you should be able to get to the money without an advisor. And, and I, I like Skype video. So send us the deck, and then first meeting, 15 minutes, Skype video, just to see if there's good chemistry, and then we like that, then come in for a meeting. Actually, absolutely use an investment banker when you sell your company. Because then you want a bad cop. Uh, and the VC can play the role or the banker can play the role. But when you're raising money, I don't want a banker to come and bring you to me. Because otherwise, you know, they, they, there's something wrong. I mean, the fact that you haven't been able to just find me and email me. Maybe to add here on, so uh, one don't is definitely in recent times, I call them opportunity seekers, no real entrepreneurs who have heard about the internet hype, which, uh, which are afraid that all the investment banks are now, uh, whatever, <laughs> um, declining in sales. And so, and then they normally come up with a very, very good presentation, market analysis, but at the end of the day, one single question, um, if, if you ask one smart single question, so why are you able to capture this market opportunity which you are showing, then is, there are no answers. So this is definitely a don't. Uh, so you definitely should focus, yeah, sh to be short on all the points which, which have been mentioned. For me, it's also important to see, to have this problem solvers um, approach that you really show, okay, I'm solving a bigger problem. I'm not uh, the new uh, whatever API for Facebook, Foursquare, which also works with Twitter and 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 so, but really say, okay, here is a problem which I can solve and this is my vision. Uh, so today I'm here, but I have a clear vision. I, I, maybe I don't know how to get there, but uh, in 2015 I have this big picture in mind. Can, can, I add one more, can I add one more thing? Of course. So I think you should really also think about, you know, um, do you want to have an investor? a VC versus, or, or an angel. Because some people, I think, should just have angel investors or families that are gonna stay out of, that are not gonna be involved. Don't need a board seat. But if you take a venture capitalist, for instance, you better be prepared to have a board and have a partnership. So some people just want the money and say, okay, bye, it's my business, leave me alone. That doesn't work if you take a venture capitalist. It yeah. can work sometimes with a family office, but uh, it's not gonna work with institutional money. And you need to think about that. Gotcha. Um, <clears throat> I I would agree with almost everything uh, said uh, by my friends, but um, on top of it, I would add, um, I want to see resourcefulness. I want to see that uh, the entrepreneur is able to do things that would normally appear to be beyond their reach. Um, sometimes it feels like, you know, like, okay, now it's time to raise money and uh, okay, now that's what I need to do. But I think, you know, uh, capital is, uh, I, mean, I think there's a lot of things you can get extremely resourceful about. Mm -hmm. Um, second thing is that I like to hear stories. Um, the, the softer narrative around you know, why the entrepreneur is doing what they're doing, why are they going after this, 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 this opportunity? And I think through that, the answer I'm looking for for myself is um, you know, the, the real motivation. Uh, because I think entrepreneurs do uh, ventures for different reasons. You know, some do it for the money, some do it for the glory, some do it for the fame. Um, and I think it's very important for the investor to, to digest that. And, and to bounce on both, I guess, Shem and Anand's points, many people should not raise money. A lot of people should actually not raise money, even from angels, because if you're raising money, it's because you want to go and conquer the world, or at least that market. You want to build something very big, because we're going to want an exit, and we want you to go and, 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 co and conquer the world. If you're not the guy who wants to be working 24-7, seven days a week, and build something really big, don't raise money. There, there are amazing companies out there that are lifestyle businesses. I mean, I meet people who, in their spare time, end up building businesses that do a million in revenues, three, four hundred thousand in EBITDA a year. They're fantastic businesses, but don't raise money for them unless you want them to be a hundred million dollar businesses and you want them to be much bigger. So there are a lot of great entrepreneurs out there who should just not raise money. That's a good perspective, a fresh perspective. Um, we're nearly out of time, guys. So. 
one kind of quick fire round. Um, and Jen, maybe you could start this. Um, you guys have you know, seen you know, dozens and dozens of businesses uh, build and grow and exit. Um, this is a room full of entrepreneurs. Um, they'd love to know, like maybe three, if you've got three insights, the key bits of advice you'd give the entrepreneurs in this room as they go forward building their business. What were the three bits of advice you'd give any entrepreneur building a business? I think um, one would be to uh, be honest to themselves uh, yeah. about the, their, their motivations, you know, why are they doing, and uh, you know, again, what are they trying to build? Are they doing this because it's fashionable, etc., cetera, um, or are they doing this to get super, super wealthy? Are they doing this to change the world like some technology entrepreneurs have? I think that, that honesty uh, for the entrepreneur to themselves is, is critical. So let me leave it at one, and I'm that's, sure that's collectively we'll moving. have uh, more so, than three. Damien. Yeah, I think first of all, um, do your homework. Uh, and I'm meaning this in, for different uh, topics. So know everything about your product, your company, your market, really everything, uh, because the most stupid and also avoidable thing is to, to not be able to answer to, to certain questions around this. And actually, uh, I think uh, Angel or VC has to really feel that you, you are loving what, what you do. Um, then the th uh, second thing, um, yeah, well, what I said before, for me it's really, imp uh, really important that you know what you want. So, and uh, this also comes back to the, uh, to the other discussion. So maybe the best thing is to not take any money from VCs or business angels. Uh, so, uh, and if you approach us, so you should know, okay, this is my vision and I need support from you guys to build uh, my vision and yeah. So we're running out of time, maybe just kind of one key kind of point you'd give any, any entrepreneur building a business, Fabrice. So I'll take it for granted, you're, you love your product, you're great at product, you, you, love, you, you know your, and you love your customer. The one thing I would do, especially if you're in, East, in emerging markets, be capital efficient. Don't raise too much money, don't spend too much money, and don't raise too much money too high valuations. Otherwise, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have follow-on capital, you're not gonna have uh, successful exits. So capital efficiency and be reasonable in your valuations. I would say have fun. Do this because you love it, because every day you are passionate about it and you're gonna go to work. Be ready to work very hard and learn how to live with big time ambiguity because you are gonna have to face very different things on a daily basis and you're gonna have to be very flexible and reinvent yourself many times. So I would just say, um, hire the best and fuck the rest. <laughs> Great advice, guys. Thank you very much, really insightful.